Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Hodson here at the Fort Worth Aviation Museum with, uh, with Gary Goff and with Tom Kemp. And uh, we're here for another, uh, another exciting episode of Fun with Aviation. It's July 22nd. And uh, this morning, what we're going to do is talk about the uh, paved nail system. And Tom's going to explain what that is uh, in regards to being used with the OV-10. So let's turn around and look at the airplane. So uh, Tom, first of all, let's, uh, let's just get a little bit of your background. Uh, Tell me a little bit about your Air Force career with the OV-10. Okay, basically uh, the OV-10 was the second airplane I flew out of, out of pilot training. I went in, in the 141 and flew the, the OV-10 uh, in 1971 and 1972. So primarily out of uh, NKP and when I was overseas in Vietnam, flew it out of NKP in Thailand. What's NKP? That's not Tom Phnom, it's Royal Thai Air Force Base right uh, okay. along the uh, Main River and just to go down through there. Okay. Um, and uh, some people refer to that as Naked Fanny, right? Yes. Naked okay, Fanny. Naked <laughs> Fanny. Now, you've got a special and room. Actually, we, what we really did call it, it was, it, it was called the Redwood Boy Scout Camp because we had all of, all of our barracks and so forth were made out of, were made out of uh, mahogany plywood and, and painted and painted and stained red. So it looked like the Redwood Boy Scout Camp. Oh, very cool. Very cool. Uh, you've got a special relationship with this airplane, though, don't you? Yes, I've actually flown this particular airplane eight times in, in, on combat training. Okay, this particular airplane, not uh, this not this ones like this, this very not airplane. Not the OV-10, but this particular, this particular airplane. Okay. And this was a two-stick airplane, and we used to call them the difference between the two-stick and the paid mail, because that's what happened with, 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 with part of the main uh, modification was that they took the, seat, the stick out in the back seat in order to put the, the, the paid mail. So okay. Well, you probably have a distinction here of having more time in a specific airplane than anybody else. Well, I don't know, Jack in the F-111 maybe, but... Uh, I have more in the F-111 than I've got. Cause I, think I, I think on eight sorties, I think I average maybe uh, about 30, 25 to 30 hours. In That's, a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. But we're going to talk about the paved nail system here today. And I know Gary's got some pictures. And uh, let, me, let me swing around here so we, can, so we can zoom in and you can take a look. Uh, so they've got a good picture of the paved nail system right now, which just kind of looks like a long black tube with a box on it or something. Uh, tell us a little bit about what the paved nail system is. And well, with the with the uh, advent of, of the laser guided munitions in, in about 1970, the Air Force decided that they really needed a fact that could, could, could illuminate. So the paved nail system itself Ill was illuminate. Very, what very does, what do you mean by illuminate? What, what, that could designate a, a laser designate a, a, a target so that the smart munitions, the laser guided munitions, could actually uh, foam out on that and then go ahead and, and uh, hit, hit the target instead of hitting the ground. Okay, so, well, you weren't carrying the laser guided weapons, though, right? No, we did not carry any laser guided weapons. All that we did was we would, we would illuminate the, for the uh, thing. And that's part of the, that was the major part of this major mod. Basically, it had a, they took this, the, uh, Stick and the, and the rudders out of the back seat of the airplane and put in the, put in this uh, what we call, affectionately call the sewer pipe and our guys in the back seat we call them foes or sewer pipe operators but it was really a, a <clears throat> kind of like a low light TV type of a scope that would that, that would sit down between the legs of the of the guy in the back seat and then he would lean into that and, and do that. Uh, and, and be able to control. He had a, a stick controller, basically, kind of like a side stick. And I don't remember right now whether it was actually attached to the pod itself or if it was on the okay. side of the airplane. But in any event, uh, he had he had that, and he could control the uh, the, the, the crosshairs in that. Okay. It, it was basically a really advanced uh, drift meter. Okay, so the pod would move, though. I think, Gary, you got another picture yeah. with the pod sideways. The pod, so. would, the, the pod would move, and, and believe it or not, to, to my knowledge, there, there, did, there was not a significant amount of, of vibration on, on the airplane when the pod moved because uh, we were talking about that today. Of course, we were only traveling at 115 to 120 knots. Okay, this, this, time, this picture looks like it's uh, turned 30 degrees or more, something like that, at least. Towards us. Pointed, yeah. Okay. Well, it, he could rotate the guy in the. Uh, the weapon systems officer could rotate the pod 360 degrees and he could take the elevation from zero to 90 degrees. And that was really important because as a fact, our, our, our um, mantra was you never hold the same heading airspeed or altitude for more than three seconds. 
Okay. And so we were always drinking and moving around like this, and so that would allow, but if the guy's got it on the spot on the ground, he could move the move the reticle and, and actually keep that on that spot as we moved, maneuvered around it, uh, even while the even while the bombs were, were, were had been released from the from the. Okay. And when you're flying this thing and turning and all that, and the guy's got his head down in the scope and he's doing it, did many of these guys puke? I would think I would throw up. I probably would have, but these guys were better than I was. <laughs> so n none of them, they could easily, I would have been so disoriented with my head stuck in a scope while you're turning the airplane. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> they weren't violent turns and so forth. And, in fact, we, we actually would back with, with the with binoculars and that's if you want to make somebody sick that's the way to do it is oh, yeah. put on the binoculars and roll it over like that and i mean it's no, thank crazy you. but this was pretty much concentrated on one spot on the ground so even though he was moving a little bit he was actually able to keep that spot on so the you had to maintain the spot for the weapon to be able to follow ride the light as they call it right. ride the light down that's to the right. target right and, and we first started out it was all night it was all night with the uh, hey david with the system and so forth because they wanted a, a fact that could illuminate at night and the, and the fighters would fly across at 15,000 feet straight and level. Now another part that we didn't talk about yet is, is that in the system we also had a Loran C and C and D is what they, what they technically call it but it, it, we refer to it as a Loran C and it would give you accuracy on the ground of, of up to less than 60 feet. Now that's a navigation system that right? That was a navigation system. Uh, Early in my career, I was a I was a navigator, and we would fly over water with Loran A, and it would you could get you could figure out which state you were in, but <laughs> or which ocean you were in. But anyhow, this was Loran C, and it was much more sophisticated, and it would it would allow you to uh, to locate the that, and then we would we would give back to the uh, the pilots on the on the, uh, in the in the in the F4s at the time. That's the only airplanes that were carrying the uh, laser guided munitions. We would give back them the we would tell them the height above the, the target's height above sea level, which we got from our radar artillery and from the land. We would also tell them what the what the run-in heading would be. They would fly over straight and level, and at at a, and a certain coordinate they would they had a formula when we would give them the Loran coordinates of the target. They had a formula that says, okay, if you're level at 15,000 feet, this is where you had this is the coordinate you used to drop it at. And when they would fly straight and level, the laser spot on the ground would actually put coming in like a big cone and so they would we called it the basket and they would have they would fly over the bomb would hit get into the basket and then you could, you could track it all the way down to the, to the, uh, to the ground to your target. so the fighters didn't have to really know where the target was or see the target no. they just had to kind of put it into a zone or they into the basket as you it. said and then the and then now the weapon is flying itself though right the weapon I mean, it's actually it's actually uh, not. There's no pr propulsion on them at all. They were just. They were just a, a dumb Mark 84. Mark 84 with tail fins on. That the that the guy. And it was really interesting because when you see the fighters drop on a, a dumb bomb, the bomb would just go like that and, and explode. Here, the bombs would. You could see them actually going down to the ground. When we were doing so the bomb's down. guiding itself on the, the light is, to stay on the, the light. The bomb is guiding its sight, itself off of the off of the spot that the, that right. the backseat right. or our weapon system. Were, was the enemy uh, able to see you and the fighters? I mean, were they trying to shoot you down? Were they smart enough to know you're the guy that they had to kill? Or did they have to try, or were they go after the fighters? Because I would think a, a straight and level target would be so much easier to hit than say you that's a little bit lower to the ground, weaving in and out. Yeah, we were, we were normally about eight or 9,000 feet above the ground. Oh wow, you're pretty because, high. Just because of the anti-aircraft fire over there. And I can, I'll, I'll relate one of the worst sorties I've ever been on, and it was the most frustrating for me because it, it, it was a night sortie, and we were up by the Dog's Head and Bank Ride Pass in that particular area, in, in, which is right on the uh, North Vietnamese border and, and the Laotian border. And we were out flying around, and the guy in the back seat is going crazy. He's got this truck park that you can see on he can actually see all of the. I want to get in the shade so the so the phone doesn't overheat. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we learned that last or, time. Or, or, the, or the speakers. Or the speakers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he was he was uh, he was just going crazy. He, he said, "I can see their flashlights on the ground." And this is a different. He says the, the guys are are marshaling him in these trucks into this truck park. He says, "Get some air." So I called our uh, moonbeam to get some air, and they, they said, "Okay, we're going to send you some F4s." And we got the we got the air, and it's. We haven't taken any hit, I mean any anti-aircraft fire yet. As 
soon as the fighters checked in and they said, hey, back, we're checking in, uh, levels, and they give us the call sign, all that kind of stuff, and, and uh, we're, we're five minutes out. At that particular time, the whole sky lit up. <laughs> and we and were, you're dodging we, we, bullets. We were, saying, we were saying, hurry up and get here. Hurry up <laughs> and get here. However, in that five minutes, unfortunately, the, whoever was in charge called up and said, hey, we're back, we're taking your fighters away, we got a higher priority target. And I'm saying, and my answer was, what's more high priority than this large truck bike right on the, right on the North Vietnamese border? What's the matter with you? They said, sorry, we've got headquarters to, to take it. So, and as soon as they said that, the fighters said, well, okay, fact, we'll see you later. The, the, the gunfire stopped. So that was really an indication, quite frankly, that they were listening to our radio. They yeah, knew our, yeah. our, they knew us by name, not by name and by call sign. Did you, on that mission, did any of it actually hit your aircraft? No. I Thank was, God. I was very fortunate in the year that I was over there. I got scared a couple times. I felt the airplane shake a couple times and looked behind me and saw some, uh, some great puffs, but that's the closest I've ever come to getting hit. Thank so God. I was very fortunate. So now, were, were most of your missions through this daytime or nighttime? Mine were, they were pretty much half of them. Really. Okay. We flew about most of it was designed to be a night system, but once they got, once they've proven it was it was working better, they actually turned it into a day mission, and that was a little bit of different, a different approach for the for the fighters because at that time, uh, when we when they put the Loran system in and they put the put the tape spot system in, which by the way was was uh, designed for the O2, uh, but it was actually used used for the OB10 once they took the O2 out of out of out of service before they, they actually before it even got into service. In, in that particular case, we still have the capability with our, our marking white phosphorus, marking rockets, and so forth. So we would uh, we would actually go and identify the target, mark the target with the with a with the smoke, and then the, we would, the the fighters would use a, a dive process. So it only took maybe uh, because from 15,000 feet it took at level it took about 37 seconds for the weapon to hit the ground. On, on when they would dive and they would get down to close to our altitude, it would take maybe six. But you could still see it flying, and, so and it was amazing how it could fly because some of these guys in the back seat were really interesting and, and were really good with the program. I flew with Rick Atkinson, who actually was part of the design and testing of the program, but, uh, several times. But they could actually look at us in, in, in the, the mountains over there. They were straight up and down mountains. We called them car, they were called karst, and they would have caves in the bottom of them. And the guys would take the spot and they would put the spot on the bottom of the cave. Back in the 70s, this is true. It was a very big deal. Now with the, the laser guided bombs, those are actually just a, a, a standard bomb and they the put a Mark kit on them. Mark 82s and Mark 84s with a set of fins and a, and a control head. Uh, 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 actually, it's got a speaker on the front and a, a control head. So it was back. just a kit that they put on a standard yeah, bomb. A and a Mark 82, for those who don't know, is a 500 pound. A Mark 84 is a 2,000 pound bomb. Okay, good. And so now, were, were most of your missions uh, pre-planned, or were you ever going out and just looking for targets of opportunity? I would say about a third of them were pre-planned, maybe a few less than that, but most of it was targets of opportunity. We would go out and do our normal VR. We would we would have some uh, some areas that we could, uh, we knew that there was stuff in from other intel reports and so forth, so we'd go look to find them. One of the big things that they started to do uh, was that they would do what they called what they wanted to call blocking belts, and they would go out and we would take these river crossings where the trucks would go, the North Vietnamese trucks would cross the river. And the plan there was to put the, to put the Mark 82 smart bomb right in the middle of that uh, that, that river crossing, to blow it up and make it unusable, and then they would come in with other aircraft and put down what we call gravel. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but the gravel is basically small, like little little mini bombs, basically. Looks like looks like gravel and it looks like rocks. And oh, the bomb looks the BDUs. Yes, they were basically BDUs. Okay. Yes. And so they would. Uh, bomb damage, uh, uh, bomb de damage units or bomb detonating units. Bomb, bomb, yeah, bomb yeah. 
they, they look like, like baseballs. They kind of like small hands. Yeah, and they, they look like baseballs. <laughs> yeah, they look like, the, yeah, look like baseballs. And the the weapon would open up and spill out hundreds of them. Yeah, yeah. And that's the and but unfortunately the first one they tried that out a couple of us crew from our squadron actually went down to do this right in the catcher's mitt, which was a big big crossing with nine. I think it was Highway 9 was on one and, and one of the crossing there. And the facts got, they actually were in the middle of a, it was a very well protected crossing. They were in the middle of the, uh, the uh, gun, a gun emplacement. And they ended up with 37 millimeter shot down the facts. And, and we lost them. Uh, we actually we didn't lose them. We got them both back after about 250 some sorties wow. that we lost. Wow. They were they were there overnight, but in the middle, and we we put it in, and we ended up bringing and bringing the, the, uh, the uh, helicopters in and guiding them into it. Uh, actually, yeah. and that was one of the big uh, another big thing that the system did was that we used it for uh, downed airmen uh, for search and rescue, search and SAR, and search and yeah. rescue, and we would go look and find the spot, the thing marked mark the spot on and then go pick up the helicopters and bring and lead them in right to it and, and guide them so that we could get So right they could use the laser to guide in on it so on something. The helicopters I didn't think had the laser. They just we just had to mark we just had to tell them what, where they were, how, okay. them, how to do it. Okay. And in the meantime, if what well, before the helicopters are getting there, we are putting smart bombs and, and dumb bombs and anti personnel stuff down or all around all around them so that we by the time the, 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 the helicopters get there, uh, it's a significantly lower uh, lower threat, threat area. So uh, get them out safely. We've got Gary here, and we were talking a little bit before about, uh, Tom, obviously you flew in Vietnam in that era, uh, and Gary flew uh, as a Cold War warrior in Europe with the OV-10s, and you guys were talking a little bit about the differences in training. So, Gary, why don't you just slide over here a little bit, and the two of you, uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit about the, the differences in the way you both trained to use the airplane. The good news is both of us had to go to Hurlburt to learn how to fly the OV-10. You did it in the 70s, I did it in the 80s. And you had, what did you, about uh, three months of training, right? We had three months of training, basically. Uh, we, we flew uh, uh, pretty much the same type of things. We flew the map reading, navigation, low-level navigation, that type of thing. Uh, we did some, actually, the many little mini bombs, the blue bombs. That we right, did. BDUs. Yeah, that's what we call them. And, and, and we, would, we would drop those. We did some strafing on, on the ranges right. and so forth. We would go out and do some low-level cross-country navigation and stuff. So we never really, you know, if we other worked with another airplane and controlled another airplane, we would it would be another OV-10. We never really worked with other airplanes. Hi, right, Ron. That, 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 Go ahead. That's I'm just talking, big, talking to somebody out here. Yeah, hi, Ron. The big difference is, is when, by the time I came, 10, 12 years later, uh, in early 80, 81, I think it was, uh, we got to work with real fighters. I got to work with uh, A-7, S-16 was brand spanking new. Uh, I actually had a 111. 40, which is really weird, and then we had C model F4s from the Indian International Guard, whereas you just had to work with. So your first time to ever work with a real fighter is in country. Was in country. Holy we did, cow! We did that at uh, we did that at Fan Rang. We, we they taught us a little bit there. We worked a couple of missions in Fan Rang as, as training. That was called the, the, the schoolhouse, basically for in country. You get in your in country indoctrination. You go there and learn. The differences in the maps between Vietnam and Florida. Big difference. Different difference. Florida's just swamp, <laughs> as opposed to hilly jungles. Holy cow! But uh, anyhow, we would. Uh, we and I think we did. Now that I think back on it, we did get to work fighters a couple of times in our in our upgrade program. But then I went up to. Then I went back up to uh, the MCP, and, and that's where I really got to. Go. And you said from like the moment you stepped on country, in country, three months later, you're now an examiner on an OV-10 and it's like, so we're in a combat zone and are you having to give like instrument check rides and all those silly things that we had to do in the States? This was in 1972. You gotta be kidding me. And the, and the war was pretty close to getting it to be over so the paperwork was beginning to stick. Oh my back. gosh. But, uh, Can you imagine you're in country, you're getting shot at, but oh, oh by the way, I need to do an instrument ILS uh, uh, or an ADF uh, instrument approach. This well, is crazy. I, I'm, don't forget, I'm in Thailand. So I'm not in, I'm not in ah. Vietnam. Right. So you did everything like, say, uh, approaches to the Karat or Tok Lee or something like that? Or, or, or at NKT. Right at NKT. Right 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 okay. Right. Hi, James. I, I just can't imagine doing an instrument tech ride in a combat war zone. That just seems 
insane. Well, we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here, so I'm going to ask the folks that are online, does anybody have a question of either Tom or of Gary right now on, on uh, Pave Nail or the OV-10? Uh, Gary flew completely differently. He flew in Germany, and they were talking a little bit earlier about what the first things that they had to learn was, and uh, Gary said the first thing was the map. The first yes. thing that they had to learn is where they were. How to read the map so we could talk to the Army, because the Army does map reading completely different than the Air Force does. And so we had to learn to translate. Well, they, they, they do it at about three miles an hour. <laughs> we, we do it at three minutes an hour. Yeah, three miles a minute. Yeah. Well, we got uh, Torrin Roberts on here, too, is the, the son of uh, Randy Roberts, and he just says, Pave Nails! Pave Nails! Uh, Pave Nails! <laughs> Tell Randy, I remember Randy. Yeah, we remember Randy. We've got part of we've got we've got part of his his display in the uh, in the museum. When you uh, flew your typical uh, paid mail mission, did you have all four uh, 7.62s fully loaded? Yes, that I feel plus plus some type of rocket. So your defense mechanism was your 7.62s. Yeah, because we never got to fly with them. We, we never flew with them. We never got to use them either. We never, I mean, it's 8,000 feet, you know, unless you were down in the weeds on a, on a special mission of star or something like that. But that was, that was a couple of things I was going to mention. The OB, when they put the, took the centerline tank out to put, to put the, the sewer yeah. pipe through there, yeah. they actually, uh, we, that, would give us, that was 230 gallons. So All right. We, we put 100, 100 gallon uh, A37 tanks on, on the, they on went, the wing. Yeah, point the up wing. during the wing again. Where'd they go, Tom? I think they were right about. Right about there for okay. the hard, hard okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. So that was an external tank that they hung on. They did that on both sides, right? They did, on both sides. They did that in the Gulf War, too, on the Marine Corps. Well, yeah, the Marine Corps did that and, uh, yeah, flew flew predominantly on the D models with the wing tanks. So if, you're, if your butt wasn't sore in an A, yeah. Uh, put the tanks on it, and it would certainly get sore after. It was five hours in the airplane. So most most of our sorties were four to four and a half hours. The, yeah. the longest I ever flew, uh, the longest I ever flew was four point nine. I just look, happened to look. All of ours, when we brought the airplanes back to the United States from Germany, they took off the sponsor and the center line, and all of ours was about a four and a half to five and a half hour mission. It was like takes you forever to get there. Well, what Gary was just talking about is taking the airplanes transplant from the U.S. to Germany and back. And uh, we're going to save that for a separate uh, separate story because that's a good one that's in and of itself. dumb, one crazy stuff. One significant difference is we stacked at about 115 to 125, which is not syndicated. Gary said when they were, they, they were at 180 all the time and they were down low. When we were in Thailand, we were always... Uh, and, and I can't believe you flew it that slow. That's an O2 speed. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That would be, I would not fly that slow. No way. No way. Yeah, you, you get shot at when that happens. Yeah. Well, yeah. you're flying at the altitude that you are at, yes. But, yeah. but our altitude, we were flying at eight, sometimes most of the Above time, the small arms and the, yeah. 37 millimeter, we had 37, 57, 85, and 100 that we would deal with, but mostly, mostly 37 millimeter. And the reason we weren't down lower is that every bomber carried a, a, a uh, SA-7. Oh my, and that was the killer of it. SA7 being what? SA7 Strella being what? The A7 Strella is, is what they call it. It's a man padded A. It's a shoulder mounted uh, rocket that would. Uh, surface air missile. Surface heat air, surface air missile that would uh, get into your uh, uh, exhaust, heat exhaust. exhaust well, that's exactly what, what shot Steve that's Bennett down. Yeah. 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 And it didn't blow the airplane up, it just uh, went up and took the engine out and uh, it caught fire. And the back seat and the back seater's parachute. Yeah, and, and damaged, uh, damaged Mike's parachute, yeah. yeah. Uh, which is interesting, because if it had hit on the other side, it wouldn't have damaged either parachute and they could have gotten out. Yep. Uh, so at any rate, so uh, any other words of wisdom or pearls that uh, you want to pass along? Because uh, we're up against our time limit here. Speed is life. Dude, what are you doing flying so slow back in an airplane? That is insane. Well, that, we had it at 8,000 feet and using, and a lot of times using binocular vision on a toothpick or, or you know, 8,000 feet above the ground, you had to fly slow in order to see what, you know, pick stuff, right. stuff up. And uh, it gave us a better endurance also. It gave well, us, yeah. It gave us a, a lot more. We could just uh, one, one back. But that's, this is the, the, the external fuel tank on the, on the center line or the wing tank for the One of the things that I do want to mention is that the OB-10 was used very significantly and, and very much in 
search and rescue mission. Yep. We talked a little bit earlier about that, but uh, a lot of the a lot of the tactics for, for today were were, uh, were are, have come basically from the paved nail system. That was you know that was in 1972. It was slow. It was, it was a lot better than hitting the ground. The bombs hitting the ground, they could hit the target. But uh, today you can see what we're doing. Okay, well, that's, awesome. about, that's about all we've got time for today. I want to uh, mention to everybody that uh, we know the sound was bad the other day. It's because we had the air conditioners going. We've got one of our people trying to uh, fix the sound on that interview with Jim Lair because we do have more to talk to, uh, to Jim about. I'd like to thank Tom and Gary for being here today. Uh, another good episode. We've already been told the sound is good and, uh, and the camera didn't flip around today, so we've got, a, <laughs> we've got an OK3 wire by one there of the guys. Go. Y'all come out and look at the Jets. Yeah, come out and look at the Jets and a couple little short commercials. Number one, August 8th, we're going to be doing a car show out here from 8 in the morning until noon. Uh, we're going to have about 200 cars on display out here. If you go to Eventbrite and look up the Fort Worth Aviation Museum car show, uh, if you'd like to uh, bring your car out and put it in the show, that's available to you. Otherwise, the uh, museum will be open for normal visitors that day. but. We could have a couple hundred cars out here around the airplane, so that's going to be pretty cool. cool and this pictures. is going to be our Great our pictures. first uh, our first ever car show. Other than that, we're open Saturdays from nine until two, and uh, we'd enjoy having you come out. And you'll notice that uh, Tom and Gary are both wearing their very stylish Fort Worth Aviation Museum uh, mask. And uh, this is something new we just got. Oops, this is something new we just got in. So uh, at any rate, and uh, we're looking to put up a, a new gift shop online shortly. We've been working very hard at this, and uh, hopefully, if not this week, by next week, we will have our complete gift shop online for everybody. So from the Fort Worth Aviation Museum, home of the most touchable warbirds in Texas, thanks for joining us. Uh, stay safe, stay apart, and we'll see you on Saturday. See ya.